top Chinese scientist concedes that coronavirus may have leaked from Wuhan lab. The former head of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, George Gao, suggested in a BBC podcast that the coronavirus could have originated from a laboratory accident at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Gao's remarks indicate a shift from the initial belief that the virus originated at a wildlife market in Wuhan. While he did not provide evidence to support this claim, Gao did not deny the possibility of a lab leak either. The acknowledgement of an investigation into the Wuhan laboratory suggests that Chinese authorities took the lab leak hypothesis more seriously than previously indicated. China has vehemently denied the possibility of a lab leak and has propagated conspiracy theories about the virus originating elsewhere. The debate over the virus's origins continues, with some advocating for reforms in the wildlife trade and laboratory safety practices, regardless of the virus's exact origin. U.S. Treasury official meets with China's new ambassador in Washington. U.S. Treasury Undersecretary Jay Shambaugh met with China's new ambassador to the United States, Xie Feng, to maintain open communication between the two largest economies. The meeting addressed U.S. concerns while emphasizing the importance of close communication on global economic and financial issues. Bilateral engagement on economic matters has increased, but tensions persist in security-related areas. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has expressed a desire to visit China this year for discussions with her Chinese counterpart. The goal is to establish a constructive and fair economic relationship and responsibly manage the overall bilateral relationship. Russian forces tried to blow up my men, says mercenary boss Prigazin. Russian mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigazin accused pro-Moscow forces of attempting to blow up his troops in eastern Ukraine. Prigazin's Wagner Group had recently withdrawn from the town of Bakhmut and handed over their positions to regular Russian forces. He claimed that his men discovered explosive devices, including anti-tank mines, planted by defense ministry officials in rear areas. Prigazin suggested that the charges were intended to target Wagner Group as they advanced. No explosions occurred, and Prigazin characterized the incident as an attempt to publicly disgrace his group. The Russian Defense Ministry has not yet commented on the accusation. Prigazin had previously expressed concerns about the lack of ammunition and requested an investigation into potential crimes committed by senior Russian defense officials in Ukraine. Bank of China Chairman Visits Papua New Guinea Amid Sino-US Strategic Rivalry Bank of China Chairman Gu Haijiao has traveled to Papua New Guinea PNG, in an effort to secure an operating license for the bank in the country. PNG is seeking to enhance its trade with China while expanding its defense ties with the United States. China has been actively involved in infrastructure development and financing in the Pacific Islands, and last year, it entered into a security pact with PNG's neighbor, Solomon Islands. PNG Prime Minister James Marape expressed the importance of Chinese partnerships in his country's progress and highlighted the potential for the Bank of China to facilitate transactions and promote economic growth. Bank of China has applied for a commercial operating license, and if approved, PNG could become the bank's regional headquarters for the Pacific Islands. The establishment of a Bank of China branch in PNG aligns with China's Belt and Road Initiative and aims to deepen cooperation in renminbi settlement and promote cross-border trade and investment between the two countries. Theater in Democratic Taiwan stages Hong Kong play about Tiananmen Square. A Taiwan theater is staging a play about the Tiananmen Square crackdown in Hong Kong to commemorate the 34th anniversary of the event. The play, titled, 35th of May, explores the grief of parents who lost their son in the Tiananmen Square protests. The theater group, supported by Amnesty International, aims to highlight not only the 1989 incident but also the shrinking freedoms in Hong Kong. Due to restrictions on dissent, Hong Kong can no longer hold large-scale vigils for the Tiananmen Square crackdown, leading other cities like Taipei to keep the memory alive. The play addresses authoritarian and totalitarian situations beyond the Tiananmen event. Although the play has not been officially banned in Hong Kong, concerns about censorship and repercussions have made actors apprehensive about participating. The staging of the play in Taiwan serves as an important platform to uphold freedom of expression. The founder of the Hong Kong Theatre Group is working on an English version of the play to spread its message. The play's underlying message emphasizes the importance of cherishing and preserving freedom and democracy. South Korea says some countries ignore and Korea's unlawful behavior. South Korea's defense minister expressed concern that some countries are ignoring North Korea's unlawful behavior, which poses a threat to UN sanctions against its missile and nuclear programs. 
China and Russia disregarded a U.S. call for the UN Security Council to condemn North Korea's recent satellite launch attempt and instead blamed the U.S. for escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea emphasized the importance of trilateral security coordination with the U.S. and Japan to deter North Korea. The three countries have agreed to share real-time North Korean missile warning data as part of their efforts to enhance information sharing and missile tracking. CIA Director Burns made secret trip to China, report. According to the Financial Times, President Biden sent CIA Director Bill Burns to Beijing to meet with Chinese officials and emphasize the importance of maintaining open lines of communication in intelligence channels. This visit by Burns reflects the influence of China's national security establishment on its internal strategic policy discussions. The purpose was to address Chinese concerns about the U.S. promoting pro-democracy protests and destabilizing China's regime security. Burns aimed to reassure China that the U.S. does not have strategic intentions to undermine its stability. The visit took place before Biden predicted a thaw in relations with Beijing at the G7 summit. Despite the discovery of a Chinese spy balloon over the U.S., the U.S. and China have shown some openings for dialogue, including a meeting between National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Chinese Foreign Affairs official Wang Yi. While Chinese officials declined some invitations for meetings, brief interactions have taken place, such as between Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Chinese Minister of National Defense Li Shangfu at a defense summit in Singapore. The U.S. continues to express readiness for dialogue with China. Sanctions on Russia over Ukraine must be maintained, Japan says. Japan's Foreign Minister, Yoshimasa Hayashi, stated that Japan and like-minded countries should remain united and maintain sanctions on Russia until it ends its aggression in Ukraine. Hayashi emphasized the importance of the G7 and other countries staying united and continuing severe sanctions against Russia based on their actions and statements. He expressed hope that the sanctions would prompt Russia to cease its aggression, leading to dialogue and peace talks. During the G7 meeting in Hiroshima, the leaders reaffirmed their commitment to sanctions against Russia and pledged to prevent any circumvention of those sanctions. The G7 countries specified restrictions on exports of machinery, tools, and technology that could be used in Russia's war efforts, as well as limitations on its revenue from trading metals and diamonds. Path is open for Ukraine to join NATO, British Defense Minister. On the sidelines of the Shangri-La Dialogue security meetings in Singapore, British Defense Minister Ben Wallace expressed support for Ukraine's inclusion in NATO, stating that, that path is open, to them. However, he acknowledged that adding members during an ongoing conflict is not feasible and emphasized the importance of aiding and arming Ukraine to enhance its short and long-term security. Ukraine's NATO membership will be discussed at the group's summit in July, with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky seeking a clear decision. While a strong decision is not expected, Ukraine hopes for a detailed roadmap. Britain has provided significant assistance and weapons to Ukraine and is committed to offering security assurances, including mutual defense pacts and armed support. In the Asian region, Britain is committed to supporting the US and its allies, maintaining freedom of navigation, and enhancing cooperation with like-minded allies in response to China's military investment. Defense Minister Wallace also mentioned the importance of the AUKUS agreement and expressed openness to becoming NATO Secretary General if offered the position. U.S. takes countermeasures against Russia's violations of nuclear treaty. The Biden administration has announced that it is withholding key information on U.S. nuclear weapon stockpiles as a response to Russia's violations of the New START treaty. Russia had suspended its participation in the treaty in February and had been violating its terms since November by not attending meetings and withholding data. The freeze in communication raises concerns about the lack of a formal arms control agreement between the world's two largest nuclear weapons states. The US has notified Russia of these countermeasures but remains open to working constructively to resume treaty implementation if Russia returns to compliance. The withheld information includes telemetric data on missile launches and notifications on missile status and updates. Inspections of nuclear sites have also been halted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The U.S. continues to provide Russia with notifications related to other agreements. The U.S. is committed to the New START Treaty's limits until 2026 and is open to negotiating a new treaty or reaching an informal agreement for post-2026 arms control. Bilateral engagement is seen as necessary to establish a framework beyond 2026.